Hello and welcome to another OK episode of your favorite OK podcast, Dad and Sons, an OK podcast. This week we we have a a much more special than than OK guest. Uh, hello and welcome, Jason Schreier of uh, Bloomberg, formerly Kotaku, the the famous, the infamous, the one serious journalism and game journalism. Hello, how are you? Hello, thank you guys for having me. I have to <laughs> disagree with. The characterization that I'm the one serious <laughs> journalist, but uh, plenty of good journalists out there. Yeah, I I, I remember a similar a similar thing also came up when we were doing the the interview for that 90 minute media literacy video. I remember you pointing out that like there are a lot more than people do typically give credit for. You've um definitely made a name for yourself in terms of covering uh crunch and also the, the 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 human cost of what goes into an indie game behind the scenes with uh, your your previous book blood sweat and pixels and you just came out with press reset which is specifically about another problem the the gap in the schedule between projects what happens when when people get laid off and studios downsize in between massively expensive time consuming game projects I really like having a man who has given me, as a game developer, an existential crisis of 30 that my career is not going to last. I love you, Jason. Thank you. Is it, uh, <laughs> you, one has to ask, is it uh, the journalist who has given you the existential, no. existential crisis or the industry? <laughs> that the is industry, me, yeah. Th- yeah, that my ignorance day to day feigns. But um, no, I mean, I finished Press Reset last week and. I've talked to you multiple times about Rockstar and the, you know the past and those kind of things and man it's uh it's depressing it's that yeah the read is so interesting like if you can pull yourself away from it but then you know I think you've probably spoken to a few different devs about the book of course and you know people who maybe were not involved but have maybe given you advice over the years about situations and certain stuff like that but yeah you read it from a dev point of view and you're like fuck no one is secure nobody it's it's scary it really is quite scary but it's so interesting to just especially for me like drawn from other people's experiences i imagine the way george has read it and sort of approached it and stuff like that is very different yeah <laughs> you're definitely more like man that the industry does suck but <laughs> for me yeah, it definitely hits home in so many different ways but it's such a great book and also uh reading it from from the journalistic perspective as well it's always fun to see how you manage to get interviews that are about real vulnerabilities in the industry things that uh that 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 do sometimes paint a more unflattering picture than otherwise i was wondering what sort of challenges you get faced with sometimes when the subjects you want to cover in the interviews that you do are going to be opening up wounds like this Mm. Yeah, I mean, it depends, right? Uh, the first challenge is getting someone to talk in the first place, which is uh, usually the most difficult part of the whole experience. Because mm-hmm. if someone wants to talk and they want to tell their story, I mean, first of all, I'm always super grateful whenever someone is interested in talking and sharing their story. And I think it's super helpful for everybody. But when someone wants to talk, that's kind of that first barrier let down. And then it's a lot easier to get to know them and tell them a bit about who you are and kind of uh, build a rapport and build a level of trust between the two of you that helps you get into those vulnerabilities. But yes, I mean, I think that like as journalists, especially in games where the industry is so controlled by PR and it's so opaque and there are so few opportunities to really get to know people. A lot of journalists in this industry are used to maybe like getting an interview when PR decides, okay, it's time to hype the new Far Cry game. So we're going to start doing interviews with the director and everybody gets half an hour to ask them about how many weapons there are and all the other stuff that all the marketing beats we want to hit. And there aren't a lot of opportunities for your kind of average journalists in games to really sit down and get to know someone from a human point of view. And that's one of the things when I was writing Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, which is a book about how games are made, um, told through a bunch of different case studies about games, I spent a lot of time on kind of the bigger picture, broader story of like, okay, here are the beats of what happened to Uncharted, and here's the E3 demo that went awry, and here's the crunch that people had to go through, and that sort of stuff. But what I found was that the most interesting parts of that book were the human stories. Um, Everybody's favorite chapter was the one about 
Stardew Valley, which was a, one about a single guy and and his his sacrifices for for the sake of greatness. And what I really wanted to do for Press Reset for my next book is tell more of those human stories and focus entirely on humans rather than the bigger picture, like how did this game get made, which is also worth telling. But I, I was just more interested in the human perspective for this. So to answer your question, I mean, I I, I don't think that it's not necessarily that there are like big challenges involved in getting someone to like open up and and share their vulnerabilities. It's more about explaining to them, hey, like this is going to be a story about some really rough stuff. Let's sit down and get to know each other and I'll talk to you and we'll have multiple conversations over the course of time. And rather than thinking of it as like a traditional interview where it's like, okay, got half hour, got to slip in all those questions, try to get a scoop out of you. It's more like, getting to know someone um it's it's almost like becoming their friend although you it's it's dangerous when you start to cross lines of like friend versus source versus whatever else and that can get into all sorts of interesting ethical questions and and murky territory but you really get to know these people and so i really got to know some of these people and just have stayed in touch with a lot of them um even after the course of reporting and i think that's the important part is just really getting to know them and letting them get to know you and letting them get a chance to open up. And I mean, it can be super cathartic for people. I, I joke all the time and people joke to me that like that talking to me and complaining to me and, and talking to me about their story is like talking to a therapist. And I'm like, OK, I'll give three <laughs> free therapy. That's my job as a journalist is to give give free therapy to everybody that I talk to. You know, with all due respect, I I do remember making that comment in the very beginning. It it just does seem like game journalism is is so far skewing towards the PR end of the industry of um, cycling into the the hype campaigns of new products that the stuff that you do does feel a little bit like an exception, right? Why why do you think there isn't more of that more editorial feature type interview driven journalism in, in video games? Well, there is. I mean, I look at something like, um, I mean, some of the stuff you've done, George, certainly, but um, some of my favorite stuff is like Chris Bratt and People Make Games. He's doing that sort of um, interesting human stories all the time. Mm. Even the big corporate gaming sites, IGN, GameSpot, are publishing human interesting stories all the time. I mean, they don't get as much buzz as the the new preview for Assassin's Creed 4000, but, um, right. but they're, they're still happening. So yeah, I, I just kind of fundamentally disagree with that. But I do think that there is a lack of real I don't want to say investigative journalism because there is some investigative journalism but but like really um, deep dive stuff stuff that would require a reporter to spend a month talking to um, 50 sources and getting that turning that into a massive feature the stuff you would see in New York Times magazine or like Bloomberg Business Week or something like that and I think the main reason for that is is simple it's money it's you no know, few gaming sites can afford to allow a reporter to go off and 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 spend that much time I'm doing this sort of like deep dive reporting and I've been very fortunate in my career and I, I think luck plays as much a, a part of uh, as anything in in the reason that my career has gone as well as it has um, but I've been very fortunate to be in positions both at Kotaku and now at Bloomberg where I have the freedom to take the time to go off and, and do reporting or I can fit it into my days um, in addition to other stuff so like at Kotaku what I would often do is I would be doing kind of short term stuff on a daily basis and then I would try to structure my day. So I had a couple hours here to do uh, your daily news blog, whatever, and then a couple of days to get on the phone with people and do some reporting for for stories, um, for long form stories. And even like the job of a reporter isn't even to like, if, if you're really diving in and doing that sort of work, you can't even know for sure that what you're doing is going to lead to a story. So you might spend two weeks of, of work um, just getting on the phone with people and reaching out to people only for things to fall apart and to, for you not to actually get anything on the page. So financially, I mean, media outlets and especially gaming outlets are already on this like razor thin edge of, of profitability as it is. They can afford to like pay someone a decent salary to go off and, and go on like what could be chaotic, uh, quixotic, quixotic, quixotic quests <laughs> for like uh, for stories that might not actually pan out. So yeah, I mean, that fundamentally is it. Like I, I, I think that there's certainly a stigma out there and there's certainly a belief among like the, the, the Rossetti or the Reddit crowd that like, oh, there's no talent in games journalism. And I really do not think that that is the answer at all. Do you feel like you personally, though, have sort of opened a door for more people to do that by showing the value in in not only, of course, that it can attract an audience to read that kind of thing. I mean, you have two successful books now based on this sort of investigative journalism, but also looking at the horrible side of it, which is, you know, the people who run the websites who want to draw the traffic 
looking at your work and seeing the numbers in which that kind of brings it in, do you feel like, you know, the sort of, you know, persona you've crafted for yourself as, as being this, you know, incredible investigative journalist has opened the doors for more talented people to come through as well, who maybe prior were not getting a chance until you were sort of doing that work? Because there doesn't really seem to be anybody before you. I, I hope so. I, I disagree that there wasn't anybody before me. I mean, I, when I was coming up, there were a lot of people I admired. Um, Stephen Tatilla, my old boss at Kotaku, mm. was one of those people. And um, Lee Alexander, who doesn't do journalism anymore. Simon Parkin. There were a lot of people who I grew up yeah. admiring, who whose who's work I still follow today. But yes, I mean, I certainly, I, I hope so. I hope that I can can lead the path and, and, and that people can, get, if my work allows more people to do this sort of thing, that that's thrilling for me. Actually, one of the most exciting things that I've heard of the years is that people have been using Blood, Sweat, and Pixels and the success of that book and the fact that it was a bestseller as kind of like a, a comp while pitching their own gaming books and that it's opened the door for some other potential gaming books over the years, which I think is really cool because there was certainly a time when I was pitching my first book, Blood, Sweat, and Pixels, a lot of editors were just like, oh, nobody buys video game books. Like people only buy like the <laughs> Minecraft shit. So yeah, it was. Uh, it's it's been cool huh. to see. Um, I, I don't mean I, the Minecraft strategy guides. I don't mean like it's it's crappy or anything. I just yeah, mean yeah, that's yeah, like yeah. what people bought. That's what kids were buying at the store. Like nobody uh, editors did not think that anyone was buying like gaming books really. And yeah, I mean, look if if I can be an inspiration for people and and that open help open doors for people, that is super thrilling to me. I, I disagree with the premise that like there's no talent in games mm. journalism. I think that the the lack of like of deep dive stuff and, and real hardcore adversarial journalism is because of systemic issues, not individual issues. Uh, the other thing is like to your point, Liam, I don't know how many big gaming sites want to deal with the baggage that someone like me would bring with them because Yeah, that's the other thing, right? You it's, have to um... piss off gaming companies. Bethesda has not talked to me since 2013. So if I <laughs> IGN were to say tomorrow, okay, we want a hard boiled, like an adversarial reporter who's really pissing off companies, it would destroy, it could potentially destroy their access to those companies. Do you feel if a company like IGN, for an example, of course, you know, the, the biggest in the world, yep. did something like that, it puts those companies in that position and where they have to transition into accepting it, kind of like how we've seen with other things like YouTube and stuff like that over the past couple of years. If they just did do it, it's not like, I mean, Bethesda are huge and now they have Xbox's backing, so it's maybe a bad example, but, you know, they can't refuse the 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 amount of use they get out of those companies in the long term of that PR marketing cycle that we just talked about, especially we're looking at Ubisoft and the Far Cry stuff now. So do you feel like they have a responsibility to try it and then see what happens with those companies? Or do you reckon even IGN would get like blacklisted? I mean, I think IGN is trying it. Like, I, I don't think mm. that these companies, that these gaming sites are not trying it. IGN just ran a great piece by Cat Bailey about Blizzard that I'm sure mm. did not thrill the people at Activision. Yes. Um, yeah, good point. These companies, I mean, I think we need I think the gaming outlets deserve more credit than they get in general that said uh, to your point what gaming companies will do as I've experienced at Bloomberg I was kind of I was fascinated when I started at Bloomberg I was like all right what's gonna happen I actually sent an email to all of the PR people that I knew even the ones who hate me um, being like hey I work for <laughs> Bloomberg now feel free to reach out um, I'd love to chat blah 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 and still uh, Bethesda's blacklisted me like other companies are pissed off at me for a variety of reasons Sony has been pissed at me since I ran a story about them a couple of months ago. EA has been pissed at me for years. Um, so none of these companies like want to talk to me or want anything to do with me. They'll, there's like they'll they'll respond to emails once in a while, but Bethesda is the only one that has strictly refused to respond to me since 2013, which which is really impressive. But anyway, the point that I was making was that sometimes um, when you're part of a large news organization like Bloomberg, what those companies will do is they'll say we'll only work with other reporters. We won't work with Jason. We've run into this a few times, and my colleagues will sometimes say. Like, you don't get to decide, Mr. PR person, which reporters you work with here, um, which I think is pretty cool. And man, I, I, I really love my team at Bloomberg. And we have some really cool people and brilliant ethical people here at Bloomberg who, who say things like that. But um, but yeah, I mean, companies will always find ways to be babies. Gaming gaming publisher PR people will. It, it, there are some great PR people out there, but the ones who are babies, such as Bethesda's head of PR, will, will always find ways to be babies. And, and like, there are people in PR who like, 
recognize journalism and are like, hey, it's my job to protect my company, but I recognize that it's your job to be a journalist. And we have kind mm-hmm. of, I have a respect for you and I hope you all have respect for me. And, and there's just a mutual respect there, which I always appreciate. And then there mm-hmm. are other people, like a certain face of Bethesda, who uh, you may have seen a few times that at their conferences, who just believe, who have this fundamental, like old school belief that the press should be an extension of marketing, period. And when they are not, we do not want to work with them at all. And that's the case with Bethesda. And that's why they haven't talked to me <laughs> in eight years. Years. <laughs> Do you, does that extend to your own home and you won't play Bethesda games or are you not that babyish? <laughs> no, of course not. I, in fact, I've treated Bethesda just as fairly as I would treat any other company and reached out to them for comment <laughs> on stories. And I know they'll never respond, but um, it would not be fair to punish companies for the uh, for the the immaturity of their PR people, as, as tempting as it might be. But it really, it's such a detriment for them. I, what, what a lot of pe- PR people don't understand and what the best ones do is that refusing to comment at all to a journalist is just going to hurt you and and make your make stories about you way worse yeah as opposed to like offering your own perspective and trying to fa- and helping fact check and offering comments and it's just like like this opacity in gaming is just so detrimental to everybody and the way the PR people work in gaming for the most part again there are some pretty good people out there but for the most part it's only hurts these companies it's definitely painting a strange target on your back when you're like, well, we've blacklisted you. And, you know, Kotaku turns around and is like, well, Bethesda has blacklisted us, so we don't know what is this. And then just that is out there, like a weird foul smell yep. for everybody to digest and be like, well, what did they get blacklisted for? And it's something inane to do with announcements or leaks or whatever. And mm-hmm. then... Everyone's like, come on, Bethesda. Like, what are you doing? Yeah, although I will say that it's it's one thing that does disappoint me. George, maybe you'll appreciate this. This is this is the one area where I'll criticize my colleagues in journalism a little bit. It does disappoint me that people are still like bringing Pete Hines onto their podcasts and like acting like there's that things are hunky dory and not kind of showing some level of solidarity. And maybe the time for this was years ago because it's been going on for so long now. But there was a story in the the film press where Disney blacklisted the LA Times, I believe it was, and a a bunch of other reporters got together and were like, we refuse to cover Disney until they remove this blacklist. And it was this like really cool solidarity movement that was really awesome to see. And we haven't seen anything of that sort in the games world. And and people are just still kind of like, because they get so many, because all they get is scraps from these game companies, they have to take what they can get. And that's kind of sad to see. It's kind of sad to see people just like treating this as like, oh, okay, who cares about it? Um, And just moving on. But it is what it is. For um, more more human centric editorial stories, I don't know if if you would feel with me on this, but it almost seems like if you're looking for someone to reach out to you, maybe anonymously or pseudo anonymously, about something that's not going to be that flattering for the company in the first place, it's almost like for that kind of journalism, you don't necessarily need to be on their good list because to get that story done, you don't need an early copy for the game they're making or an early um. A look at a, at a preview scoop and I uh, I do wonder sometimes how those stories still manage to be the bread and butter of the game journalism industry. It really drives up a lot more clicks to see a new game get revealed versus finding out some unflattering detail behind its its development. But I was wondering if, if you feel that that uh, kind of relationship is still necessary for an investigative journalist rather than a... Um, Oh, I don't know. Where, 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 where would you categorize the traditional game journalist? Yeah, I mean, I think that that it's a hundred percent necessary. And in fact, like when I talk about blacklists mm-hmm. and and my complaints about blacklists, I'm not even talking about like early review code and previews. Like that stuff is it's cool. I mean, I'm always happy to get early code, and I it makes my coverage better for like stuff like the Triple Click podcast and other stuff that I do. It's certainly useful, but that to me is not as much of a priority as being able to talk to the people at these companies. And so, for example, let's say I'm doing a story about Crunch at Naughty Dog, and let's say that Sony is like, okay. Okay, we're pissed off at you. We're not going to talk to you, Jason. Sorry, mm, we hate okay. you. Then my story is inferior. It's by nature worse because I haven't gotten to hear Naughty Dog's perspective. I would love for all of these stories. Oh. If if I get if I get a message from disgruntled employees and they're like Naughty Dog is crunching us, like things are brutal here, I will a hundred percent of the time reach out to Naughty Dog for comment because I want to hear their perspective. I want it's only fair to give them the chance to defend themselves and to provide context. Even if they wanted to talk to me off the record, I would certainly be willing to hear their perspective on certain things because it makes for a better story. Every story is better when you have heard from every 
single person involved and not just one one side of the equation. Yeah. And let me give you a good example. So Activision Blizzard, I have covered them quite critically over the years. I've been, I mean, my, I've been kind of breaking, I, I broke the news years ago about Activision's corporate influence on Blizzard, and I've been reporting a whole lot on Blizzard, their salary complaints and, and all sorts of other issues that they've been facing and the Activision takeover of Blizzard culture and, and that whole story, which is to me a fascinating story. Um, one of the biggest in the video game industry. Activision Blizzard, if they were run by babies, they could easily just... <laughs> <laughs> ignore me and never talk to me, never respond to my emails. But because they actually have pretty good PR people um, who who have like a mutual respect for me, I think despite my adversary, very adversarial reporting about them, they will respond to every single question and they want the chance to comment on every single story. And that a makes the stories better, not just for me and for readers, but also for them because they get their voice in there. And it B, it just like creates this relationship where it's I don't have to feel like, oh man, these guys are blacklisting me. They're not going to respond to me on anything. And and suddenly the story is like only one side of things. It's just it's it's just a better better for everybody. It's a better ecosystem for everybody. For someone like Bethesda, um, to for like for some someone like Bethesda's PR department to decide we are. Never never going to talk to anybody about these stories. We're never going to respond to Jason on anything. It's just not only is it make you seem like a baby, it's also just worse for you because you look worse um, by not getting your voice out there and not giving interviews with management and that sort of thing. So yeah, to your point, it's really important for companies to participate in stories like this and to make their management available for interviews and to offer comment yeah. when needed and to address questions and even yeah. to correct things. I mean, sometimes if, if, if I'm still in the fact checking process of a story, I often send like um, what I usually do is I send bullet points of like, here's everything I'm going to include to a publisher in order to give them a chance to comment. And sometimes I'll be like, oh, no, actually, you got this number wrong. And that's, again, helpful for everybody. So like, even though it's adversarial journalism, that doesn't mean just shutting off the company and being like, like, I'm not going to talk to you because I'm just trying to trying to do this reporting on you. It's very important to work with companies there. And as the adversarial journalist, you would still want that outlet for follow up questions. Yeah, well, for any I mean, I, I would want if I'm doing a big feature about how Anthem was made and what happened there, um, what I'll typically do as first, I'll send an email to them and say, hey, I'm working on this big feature. This is maybe like a week or two in advance of the story running. I'll say, hey, I'm working on this big feature. I would love to do an interview with management. And usually they'll be like, no, or like, tell me more about the feature. And then what I'll do is once I have all of the reporting together, I will put together a list of bullet points and be like, I believe very strongly in no surprises journalism. Any Anyone who's being written about should not be surprised by what they see in an article. So I will put everything in bullet points. I will say, hey, EA, here is exactly what's going to be in the article. And then I'll give them the, the opportunity to say, you to comment, um, to respond individually, to just send over a generic comment, whatever they want. Now, in that particular story's case, what they did was they planned, they published, uh, they planned a blog post that was just embarrassing for them and published it at the same time as my article went up instead of commenting, which just totally backfired and made them look like total morons but um but but in in a lot of cases people will respond and they'll say okay we're not going to comment on this this and this but we'll give you a statement on this or like we'll we'll make this person available for an interview or whatever else it is um it's really important for for game companies to do that and it just makes for better reporting and it, it serves readers for the best so then sorry this is a george question i think uh, in terms of like how you how do you transfer that type of thinking then and like in regards to writing stuff that is more specifically for an audience that is key to you know understanding the language of games and sort of the ecosystem mm. of like what EA is up to what Bethesda is up to you know everyone has to have some sort of innate knowledge uh, to be able to understand what is going on in those things but then when you switch to writing a book about these things how do you sort of transfer that process into yeah. being like okay how do I not dumb this down necessarily, but like reframe it so that people understand it from the get go. The books do seem specifically like they're written for a more general audience than the online articles. Um, and I was wondering how the the logistics of that work, like why there is a different audience for your books versus your online reporting. Yeah, well, a couple of things here. First of all, my the the audience for my online reporting has changed a lot from when I was at Kotaku to now to being at Bloomberg, where I've been for the best year or so. At Bloomberg, we're writing for a very mainstream financial audience and trying to sum up the gaming industry's ridiculous quirks <laughs> in, for that audience has been <laughs> yeah, an interesting intelligence. I can, I can imagine. <laughs> 
well, my editor, when we're writing about Activision Blizzard, I have to try to explain to my editors every time that it's like, okay, so the main company is called Activision Blizzard, but <laughs> Blizzard is a subsidiary here, and Activision <laughs> is taking control of Blizzard, and they're just like, oh my god, my head is going to explode here. But anyway, yeah, no, so um, with books, I mean, first of all, there's a lot more space, and that gives me a lot more opportunity to explain things that I might not have room to explain in a thousand word article. Um, I also like to play around with footnotes um, and books, which is really fun, and, mm, and I can yeah, I noticed yeah, that yeah, 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 yeah. remarks and explanations and stuff like that in footnotes. Um, but also, I mean, I do want ideally, ideally, I want as a journalist everything I write to be readable by my mother or like someone random who I find on the street. Like I, I ideally. Aww. would want everything I write to be appealing to a general audience. I, I have the same temptation in the back of my head whenever I publish something. There's just like this little tick that's like, is my mom going to read this? Yeah, I mean, I think it's kind of a flaw of the gaming journalism world that we all kind of write and talk for just our own sphere, for the gaming community. And at GDC this year, at E3 this year, during the, you know, like those right. key buzzwords that just everybody has that understanding of. Yeah, it's unavoidable to some extent. But like mm. even at Kotaku, I tried to push everybody to be like, look, we we don't say Shigeru Miyamoto. We say Nintendo's Shigeru, Nintendo designer or Mario creator or whatever it is, Shigeru Miyamoto. Like you always explain who someone is. You always explain what something is. You don't like journalism is about providing context. That's one of the most important parts of the job. And so leaving out context, even if you know that like most of your readers are going to understand this is really not helpful. And the books are just kind of a, a natural extension of that where I write in a way where I want as many people as possible to read these books and, and understand them. I mean, one of my goals um, with books especially is to make it so anyone who finds it at a Barnes & Noble and is even mildly interested in the video game industry can pick it up and understand it. I don't want people to have to know going into this book what Bioshock is or what a frame rate is or or who Warren Spector is. Like, I want people to... to I want the book to resonate with people even if they don't know that. And I think mm. especially when, like I was talking about earlier, where, where it's a bunch of human stories that I think most people can relate to even if they don't care about video games. A lot of people you can relate to the struggles and the kind of ups and downs and the volatility and, and getting laid off and, and crunching and we're overworking and a lot of these kind of human human habits and, and or some of my favorite stuff in the book is about the the kind of the tensions of like the the people versus the product and like how you talk to people and some of the, the interesting conflicts between like um, uh, some of the people who are making Enter the Gungeon and, and their battles that they fought over the way that people would talk to each other and, and that's kind of like that's something that everyone can relate to it's like everybody who's worked in an office and who's worked with other people or tried to be creative with other people can relate to the struggles of like, okay, how do you effectively communicate with this person? Um, how do you do it? How do you give feedback in a way where it's like uh, effective and, and honest, but you don't sound like too much of a jerk? And like, these are all things that anyone can relate to. And that is part of my goal with everything, but especially with the books is to these stories that whether you care about games or not, you still might find interesting. So to answer your question, that's why I try to include so much context and explanation in this stuff. And it's still going to be enlightening for people who do know a lot about video games. I was uh, pleasantly surprised to see how much was mentioning how much work is done on projects that are going to get canceled anyway. That's something that I think a lot of uh, uh, a lot of listeners of all experience levels can still glean something from. There's also this this quote in the beginning where. Uh, where Warren Spector was told by one of his bosses that they could give uh, they could give him one dollars and get a dollar and ten cents, or they could give Chris Roberts a million dollars and get either a million a hundred million back or a tax write off. Are they really that like candid about their tax write offs? Their their tax avoidance schemes. <laughs> <laughs> I, internally, I mean, I imagine that executive did not expect Warren Spector to be sharing that in a book. It was also 30 years ago, so I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, it would have been like, yeah, years upon years ago. Well, that's the thing. I mean, years ago, the, the, the gaming industry barely existed. Like companies were kind of pirate ships. So it was, it was I'm sure there was a lot more of that. But yes, I mean, uh, a lot of the stuff is it's not illegal and that's why i mean there's just this great story by pro publica about how what billionaires are paying in taxes and it's all tiny amounts tiny percentages of their of their net worth worth and that's because it's all perfectly legal because they're not taxed on these these capital gains and and same with companies like ea like none of these companies as far as i know are doing anything illegal when it comes to their tax write-offs um it's just that's how this system works <laughs> 
depressing. So, <laughs> yeah, yeah l- Liam, unless you got another one, I was. Um, gonna, I um... actually did. I uh, wanted to ask, sort of. I think Jason, you know, I have a very great respect for you. You know, ever since we talked about the rock star way back in the day, and sort of the the actual like rippling effect you have outside of, of course, just you know, being a, a journalist and, and and writing stories and stuff internally in studios, there have been work that you've done that has changed literally, like not even hyperbole, like people's lives inside of game studios, right? There have been like knock-on effects of like the public knowledge and, and the stories that you've written about that have then gone on to improve inside studios, like the working conditions, uh, uh, you know, and overwork and crunch and all of these things at studios. But in terms of like writing the books and stuff like that, what is the kind of like general dev response to these things? Does it touch too close to home for them? And it's kind of a bit of a weird line or is like their like appreciation for the, that what you are doing? Yeah, I mean, first of all, to your point, while I'm super happy to hear that and and anything, obviously, you know, the, I am thrilled when when um when the work that we do uh, uh, changes people's hearts and and changes conditions and makes things better for people. I give most of the credit for that, uh, if not all the credit, to the people who actually speak out, like knowing that they are potentially putting their careers in risk. Like my my job is not when I when I talk to people, I am not really risking a lot. I mean, sure, I could get sued by companies or like companies can blacklist me but but i'm not really that worried about that but there still is like an adverse effect like you know we've literally just talked about the fact that people don't do that sure but 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 the the wrecks are my point is just that like all the bravery and all the credit here belongs to the people as an example at rockstar qa who speak up like knowing that it's it's risky to talk to a reporter and if they get fired they might not be able to find other work in the industry and and it's it's super super like inspirational for me and i always admire people who are willing to talk about their work conditions and tell their stories because it's just yeah it, it it's it's really great to see so to answer your question i think that it's hard to generalize and say like every single game developer does this but but i'll tell you a funny story i saw uh, a review like a user review which i know i shouldn't read but i do um i saw a user <laughs> no, review press don't reset. Read those. <laughs> i saw a user review of press reset no they're mostly good i i they they they're i'm perfectly fine with them I read a user review of Press Reset that was basically like, it looks like Jason sought out, deliberately sought out only the worst parts of the industry, like only the parts that are that are volatile and, and collapsing and stuff, whereas most of the industry probably isn't like this. And I thought that was really funny because in general, the reaction I've heard from game developers is, is oh my God, this hits so close to home. Like everybody I know has a story like this. I have a story like this. Everybody has a story like this. So it's funny that you, that you hear that kind of disparate reactions. But yeah, I mean, game developer is like many of them had different different reactions to this um the thing that that i was very happy with was hearing from a lot of people who had been through these stories being like yeah you really accurately captured what we went through accurately captured like the tone of the studio here um so that was pretty cool to see and yeah i mean uh, my hope is that this informs a bunch of people and that it gets in the hands of the people who are making decisions at these companies and maybe make them think twice um, before looking at a spreadsheet and deciding, okay, we have to lay off 200 people this fiscal year or whatever it is. So yeah, I mean, but but like to me, the mission is accomplished if it gets out there and resonates with readers and informs them and entertains them and, and that they come away from it feeling like it was worth their time to read this book. Any sort of change... I welcome, but that's kind of like the secondary goal as opposed to the primary goal, which is mm. informing and entertaining people. So the, yeah, that was what I was going to sort of talk about. Like, do you like take the responsibility within yourself? Do you feel like it's your responsibility to tell those stories? Or is it just that you're interested in telling those stories to people? And then all of that stuff that I've just mentioned is that secondary stuff, like overall, including the book and including like the investigative journalism that you do day to day kind of stuff. Yeah, it's that I'm interested. I mean, if I ever stop being interested in covering the games industry, I'll just stop. I don't feel like I I have some obligation, greater obligation or anything like that. Not waving the flag and like this is <laughs> the hill I die on no. forever. Kind of thing. <laughs> no, absolutely not. No, um, I think there are plenty plenty of people out there who could be doing exactly the same thing and are doing exactly the same thing. No, no, I'm just personally interested. I mean, the gaming industry is full of wild stories and interesting drama and and fascinating 
fascinating people. And I have never gotten bored of covering this industry. If I ever get bored of covering gaming, then it'll probably be time for me to move on and, and go do something else. But no, I still find it very interesting. Have I'm like you... thinking right now about what my my next book is going to be. And I have this like, and already there's some fascinating people that I want to get to know and and stories that I want to tell. So yeah, uh, it's very interesting to me. Very quickly then on the flip side of that, then let's say, I think, would would you say it was unfair to say that a lot of what you write about is more of the negative side of the industry? Whereas let's say, for example, you look at maybe someone like Danny O'Dwyer, who specifically with no clip is more about not the glorification of like creating games, but definitely the you know, the more like the mystery of creating games and then telling the story of how those games get, get made. Does that interest you as well in telling those types of stories or, or are you more focused on, you know, like this is an area that needs covering and this is the one that interests me the most when it kind of when it goes wrong or, or you know, when it needs telling from a different light, let's say. Yeah, I mean, there are a couple of things there. First of all, I, I think my first book, Bloodstone and Pixels, was essentially that. It was saying, hey, these are a lot of these. Most of the games in the book were remarkable creations. How are these mm. made? And kind of looking into talking to the people behind them and trying to capture the story of how it was get made, how they get made. It just happens that um, there was a lot of drama behind the scenes of all of those <laughs> stories and a lot of like uh, uh, people uh, kind of crunching and killing themselves to make those games but i think that's the reality you'll find if you get candid with most with people behind most games um and danny danny stuff is really good and there's a lot of interesting interesting stories that he uncovers as well but i think like for a story to be interesting and a lot of people don't understand this about journalism a lot of people are like why can't you cover the the game studios that are doing things right and to some extent you can and you should when a game studio is doing something right you should certainly elevate that and promote that but like a story is a story because it has conflict because it has drama because it has tension um, and that is something that I think people don't really like fundamentally understand like a story a book where everything goes right and the end <laughs> like is not a book it's it's just kind of a, a pamphlet it's like it's not a story there's no story without obstacles and tensions and conflicts like the fundamentally nature I spent a lot of time in, in college I essentially my major was I did like a create your own major type thing and my major was essentially storytelling so I spent a lot of time like analyzing what makes a great story and story structure and what storytelling is the best way to tell stories and fundamentally it all boils down to a person wants a thing there are obstacles on the way to that thing then the person either overcomes or is destroyed by the obstacles and either gets the thing or doesn't get the thing. Like, that's a story. Without the obstacles, you don't have a story. Person gets thing. Like, I, I get up and go to coffee and go to get coffee from the kitchen and then come back and mission accomplished. I got my coffee. That is not a story. But if I go to the kitchen and get coffee and there is a giant ogre in the way and I have to fight it <laughs> off before I can get to the coffee, that's a story. So I think fundamentally, like when you're asking, why are you only focusing on the negative? You're really asking mm. kind of an ignorant question because because you're essentially asking, why are you writing about story? Why are you telling stories as opposed to why are you just writing about events in someone's life or things that happen to someone? Like if I go to work every day and I have a nine to five job making games and it's awesome and I love my life and and I haven't found a single problem because everything worked out exactly how it should have worked out. That's not a story. Fortunately, no game is ever made like that. And there are obstacles on the way to every creative endeavor, which is why it's such an interesting industry to cover. But um, yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's what a story is on that note there is one happening right now that you've been freaking out on twitter that we have just enough time to give an overview and sling some jokes over about and uh -huh. that is the incredibly complicated always sunny in philadelphia bulletin board <laughs> with strings all over that is the blue box gate conspiracy theory oh man kojima fans have been driven nuts over the past week i say kojima fans as a kojima fan who who's like, I, I didn't really start paying attention to this until fairly later in the development when the official Konami Twitter account tweeted a Silent Hill uh, uh, merchandise run and it was real and that's when I started scratching my beard. But Jason, you've been on this all week. Starting back in, in June 15th, the... Uh, developer for an indie horror game named Abandoned tweeted a, a, a tease. They said, guess the name. Abandoned equals first letter S, last letter L, reveal closing in, and then they didn't give a date afterwards, and people gradually, over like one day, I say gradually, but it happened fast, people ended up 
developing mythology that they went a little nuts over. <laughs> so, I mean, yeah, where 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 are you on this right now? Because I I, <laughs> I, uh, I I did see a, a headline pop up on Kotaku saying that this conspiracy theory has ended with tears. But at the same point, I don't think we can really see closure with like when it comes to fans anticipating Kojima making a highly anticipated sequel. The uh, the 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 theories just just keep going for 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 a while i don't know if uh the never be game over theory from mgs5 is over or not but in any case this one was going to be for a new silent hill game and that turned out to not be the case right <laughs> well um as of right now we're recording this on tuesday june 22nd um there is no closure yet the story is not over yet it might not be over for a while <laughs> When I started looking into this last week, I at first was on the, oh my God, this is 100% Kojima bandwagon because A, there was a giant list of coincidences or a giant list of connections. Some of them seemed too uncanny to be coincidences. They were pretty stretchy too, though. I don't know about the whole list. I... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Some of them were stretches. Some of them were were a little more like- This is, this is like a P and a T is hidden by some trees in the graphics. Right. Right, that was a little strange. The thing that convinced me was um, was when Jeff Keighley got involved because it turns out he had been like tweeting and, and talking about this thing for a couple months now. And then he posted a video of himself, which was re really convinced me where he was answering a question someone had asked him about that. He was doing like a Q&A. And in this video, he's like smirking the whole time and being like, I don't know, guess we'll find out. I spoke to Hassan. Uh, <laughs> stay tuned to my Twitter feed. And he basically made it seem like it was the next Kojima game to be revealed on through Jeff Keighley. And of course, Jeff Keighley is the guy who long time friend of Kojima's he was the one who participated in that um fake interview with with the Metal Gear Solid guy Joachim Nagrin who was the when 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 uh when they were faking when they were doing the Metal Gear Solid yeah program. yeah yeah with the bandages all over his face I rewatched that interview today <laughs> and it was so weird so weird it's very weird but Jeff was in on it when when that happened so anyway so it was Keeley's thing that like convinced me <laughs> and then I started looking into it more looking into the history behind the guy and when I say looking into a lot of this stuff had already been dug up by like the various forums that were looking into this so it wasn't really me like poking around and being like putting on my my reporter's hat and, and doing some hardcore sleuthing it was more just reading up on what people had found and people had found like this guy Hassan Karaman who was behind Blue Box had a history of like weird games and a failed Kickstarter and it seemed like he was he had been doing this for it seemed a little too he had too much of a history to be like an actor who was just hired by Kojima or something like that. So um, then I became less sure. After talking to him, I just ran a story on Bloomberg um, on Monday night talking about what I have found and t telling the story, essentially. After talking to him, um, I get the sense that he was certainly a real independent developer. It's just that he's made a lot of big promises and said a lot of things that kind of uh, feel a little uh... off. Oh, no. So I think that is what the one of the reasons that this blew up as much as it did is because some of the things that um, were promised, for example, on the PlayStation blog post seemed a little too good to be true. And Occam's Razor would suggest that this is kind of like an indie developer who's in over his head and promising yes. the world and, and yeah. like claiming a little too much that he probably can't deliver on. I mean, we'll see. But yeah, it's that combined with all the coincidences, like his last name translating to Hideo, <laughs> if you like run it from Turkish to Japanese, that and all the coincidences, I think, have led to this explosion. And then Keeley. Keeley was a another big part of it, have led to this exploding. But yeah, I mean, at this point, I'm pretty convinced that that he's a real indie developer who um, maybe has, has gotten in a little over his head. He's made multiple comments and vi uh, he just published a video of himself saying, look, this has nothing to do with Kojima. So he He's been trying to like get things under control but yeah we'll see what happens i mean it certainly like has brought more attention to his game than he would have ever gotten before like this was a game mm. that probably would have gotten like a couple hundred eyeballs on it now it has hundreds of thousands of people paying attention so um uh, uh we'll see what happens i'm very curious to to see what his game actually looks like that brings up well, some of the, some of the more uncomfortable questions that it raises though and that's like what sort of blowback they're probably going to experience from from this kind of fan reaction and also um whether or not this sets the precedent for other indie developers to be latching on to misguided fan conspiracy theories to hype up their own product. If this is going to be something we're going to see more of in the future. Because Kojima likes to do these ARG marketing campaigns, like with MGS5 
Joka Morgren, and PT itself did not market it as a Kojima product doing Silent Hills. Fans had to solve the ARG itself. I do wonder if it's going to work out for them, if they if they know what they're doing, and B, if this is something that more indie developers are going to try to be cute about in the future later on, too. I certainly hope not. It speaks to really being kind of inexperienced if you were going to do something like that. Like uh, most uh, studios, I imagine, would just step out immediately and be like, look, no, you need to step away from this. We are not, we are in no way attached to, you know, Konami or Kojima or Silent Hill because you've got to remember that. Which they did, which they did, to be fair, they did say that. Not immediately, uh, which I think is a part of that. Maybe someone tapped him on the shoulder and was like, hey, you need to, you need to chill out here a little bit. And like a lot of this, you know, Konami and Kojima, we don't know what that relationship is like right now, do we? Of course. And then you you factored that into the situation. And some of the stuff that was floating around, like um, he'd mentioned a budget to someone of like $250,000 or something. And like anybody who's made it's fishy any game would know that that's like nothing it's real fishy uh so it did seem like it was somebody who was way over you know way over their head in this and just i don't know it was thrilling to get that kind of eyeballs on the game and then you know have fun with it in the beginning but then when it took that more serious tone it did seem uh oh things have spiraled massively out of control here but who knows? Kojima could have been playing the long game on this one. No, I wouldn't, I wouldn't put it no. past him. I would not put it past him. Maybe Hassan is just a Kojima Productions uh, Koji Pro employee this whole time. I, I think the canary in the coal mine here is their history with failed Kickstarter projects. Because uh, once that gets factored in on the resume, I highly doubt that Kojima Productions Studio would want to work with, with them. Yeah, I think that the thing that really has tripped people up and one of the reasons that there's been some it's kind of like the fuel on the on this fire is that and like there's so many kind of questionable parts of that. So for example, the kick he had a Kickstarter that was canceled after it kind of failed to raise twelve thousand dollars and raised like two hundred dollars. And in the Kickstarter he said that it was actually fully funded by a private investor, but then the game never materialized. Oh. And when I was asking him about that on the phone, he told me that they canceled it um and gave money back to the investor. He wouldn't tell me who the investor was. Okay. And then he said that this new game also has funding, but he wouldn't say where the funding came from. I asked him, hey, uh how many people work for your studio? And he said about ten. And I said, Can I talk to any of them? And he said, No. Um <laughs> He said he had a, like signed a contract with Sony. There are a lot of like questionable things, and I don't really think that they're questionable things that like lead you to conclude that this is a Hideo Kojima conspiracy, un- unless they were combined with all the other things that fans discovered. But like <laughs> at this point, I just don't. I, I it's hard to say that that is really the case. It it seems more like like I said before, Occam's Razor. Did he sound like he knew what he was talking about, or at least had a grasp? I know it's kind of hard to differentiate, but like considering how massive the situation has become and sort of maybe somebody be quite panicky or is like trying desperately to set the record straight. How did it sort of come off like in terms of like when you spoke to him? Yeah, I mean, I don't know. I don't want to read too much into like tone of voice or or, or Mm. mannerisms or anything like that. But he certainly I mean, he he sounded like a a guy who was trying to trying to make a game and and making a lot of promises and saying a lot of things that like he he seemed to believe about his game and and the potential there. Yeah, I mean, it just seems to me like an indie developer who was in a little over his head at this point um, and whose promises. I mean, like people, game companies make promises all the time that they never deliver on. But in this case, because it's gotten so much attention, if there's something that comes out that like doesn't live up to the kind of promises that he's made, then I don't know who knows what's going to happen there. But we'll see. We'll see what happens. I think it's also worth mentioning as someone who just went down the the UFO UAP hole, how incredibly easy it is to get wrapped up into a conspiracy theory these days. Mm-hmm. That um, since since you can watch these things unfold by the hour, since there's kind of an element of um of of internet culture humor behind it all, there's there's a degree of fun to be had by falling for misinformation that I think 
a little dangerous. Mm-hmm. Like uh, in, in our discussion outline here, I linked to this this MS Paint image that is absolutely hilarious of all the newspaper clippings with um, MS Paint arrows drawn between the two. I was talking to some people in the Discord about this and how uh, if Kojima was hypothetically working on a Silent Hill game, it would get announced anyway. There would be official trailers anyway. But for a lot of people, getting wrapped up in this stuff is fun. It is more about the journey than the destination. And I'm wondering if if this is is another social media internet Pandora's box people are opening that might might spiral further out of control later on if uh if things get even crazier. Yeah, I mean it's like QAnon. It's more fun to play the game of like putting these pieces together, like ARG game. Like ARGs are incredibly fun, and and it's fun to solve a mystery collectively with people online. So this sort of thing is inevitable, and I'm surprised it doesn't happen more often that people people think things are more than they seem because it's just it's super fun. I, I was having a blast like reading about all these things and be like, oh man, like these are too many too many coincidences, and it'll be horrible certainly if it leads to negative consequences for the developers involved what if it is kojima if it is kojima then nobody will ever believe him again because the <laughs> amount of like sympathy people have now towards the sun no Kar- way Karaman, like there will be a lot of backlash if it is kojima so i don't really think mm. that that's going to be the case but i think that like a lot of people have been been um speaking up and being like this is horrible like this poor guy this poor guy just wants to make a game and now he's he's the subject of all this attention and he's going to get death threats he's going to get death threats from gamers that sort of thing and while that's certainly a worry i imagine that most indie game developers and Liam i'm curious to hear your take on this <laughs> i imagine most indie game developers would kill for the amount of attention that he's gotten because in this yeah. lot of indie mm. games these days it's impossible to stand out and if not for this like his game abandoned if it ever came out would be played by like 20 people unless it's really amazing it probably wouldn't have gotten any attention and i think just like this thing is making him stand up you toss that coin every day you you would toss that coin and you would you would you'd be like maybe i can deliver on this maybe i can't it doesn't really matter my job is to make games and get it into people's homes i'm gonna toss that coin and i'm gonna see where this goes and even if it's terrible I can guarantee you it's already going to get, what, a hundred times more than it would have sold anyway out of morbid curiosity of these people wanting to see where this final product ends, I think. Yeah, you toss that coin every day. I don't care. (laughs) I guess all we can do is cross our fingers that it doesn't blow up too bad for them. And and that when 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 tossing that coin and making that decision, it turns out for the best. Thank you for coming on, Jason. Thank you for providing the world with your wonderful reporting and your wonderful books. Thank you, thank you, George, and thank you guys for having me. Um, everyone, go check out Press Reset in bookstores now, and on audiobook wherever you'd like. We will have links in the description for it. I gotta send it over to Japan. You all have no excuse. Get it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, have, have a wonderful day. Try not to stare too deep into the abyss of these conspiracy <laughs> theories out there. <laughs> All right, cool. Bye, guys. Thanks so much, Bye. Jason. Yep, thanks for coming on. Have a good day. You promised you'd take me there again someday. Oh, James! <sighs> Silent Hill. Yes! Silent Hill 2. Rated M for Mature for PlayStation 2 from Konami. And we have best-selling novelist Matt Visual with us. <laughs> I am so sorry, Matt. Hi. Yeah, I'm, I'm a guest on this podcast. Hey, how you guys doing? Well, 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 welcome to the Dad and the Sons podcast. Thank you, thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. How, how was Jason Schreider? I, I heard you guys, you had him on. Um, I wasn't here for that, though. <laughs> there was like this empty figure in the background that was sort of like there, kind of watching over us. Uh, making and, sure and we didn't step out of line. <laughs> I bet Jay- Jason's like, well, I wonder why this dude's here. Like, he hasn't <laughs> talked at all through the whole entire podcast. Just, just glasses <laughs> hovering in the shadows. He must be legal. He must be legal. <laughs> <laughs> Make sure that no one steps out of line. <laughs> He's the he's the he's the PR guy that you know Jason's usually having to deal with. Like Matt's gonna blacklist Jason from the podcast in the future. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! You wanted to talk about about Ender Lilies. You're 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 hyped about Ender Lilies. Well, I was hyped about it. Lin- all right, so or 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 not? I don't know. Well, well, like all right. I I was looking for a game to play on for the podcast, right? Because I actually have a week to myself, sort of. 
<laughs> and I uh, was like kind of recovering from huge, you know, long shifts. And I was like, oh, let me just try to find a game. And Ender Lilies popped up on my phone saying, oh, a thing on your wish list has finally got out of early access. And I was like, fuck good yeah. Good guy, Matt. Wish listing games. Good, good man. Yeah, yeah. Good oh, yeah. Of good course. Guy. That's the only way I keep track of oh, it. Oh, yeah. Man. Yeah. I gotta, gotta support the developer. You right? gotta appreciate that. <laughs> That's in God's work. <laughs> so I got up, bought it, and it has good atmosphere, good music. But I feel like there's, it's like, it's like Salt and Sanctuary. So it's a Metrovania. You have these JoJo spirits that, you know, you can equip and do special attacks with. Um, and you play a little, a little anime girl um, walking around. But it actually... That's, that's Liam's favorite. Yeah, wait, yeah. Well, wait, 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 <laughs> yeah, wait, 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 wait. He's wait, in Japan. Wait. Liam's favorite. Excuse yeah, me. Yeah. Uh-huh. <laughs> Guilty by association, I see. And um, I think... That's the pull of the, some of these guys who have it at overwhelmingly positive. Like, I don't know. I don't know what is a 10 out of 10 about this game. Not to say that it's not good. It's just like it's... It's, um, it's not the combat. It doesn't feel crunchy and, and, and it feels satisfying to do these rolls. No, she doesn't roll. She kind of dives. <laughs> It doesn't feel crunchy to dive. No, it does. The the combat does feel feel good. It does feel good. It's like a good game. You know, I wouldn't say it's for everyone. I wouldn't say go out and buy it. I don't think it's that type of Metrovania. I feel like it's like if you want something that there is some story there, kind of like when you beat the bosses, there's like a little piece of the story of what happened is revealed. But everything else is just empty and depressing. Uh, and uh, that's that's the game. Is it horror? Is it horror? It looks kind of horror. No. No. Just regular dark fantasy. Okay. Yeah. In in screenshots and video, it looks like like dense and action packed, but I feel like you're describing something that I've felt a lot of times when 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 diving through the the occasional minefield of super cheap indie games is that emptiness feeling. Yeah. Like all the all the all the most complete parts are the ones that are in the the screenshots. Yeah. It's 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 not that it's empty. They do build these these maps well, and there is significant reward for exploring um and it feels good to explore but it does feel like it's missing a special sauce like it's uh it's just too dead it's too depressing like it's just the music is kind of the same song kind of replayed at least for the first area i'm like what like three four hours in i'm pretty sure i'm gonna go back and beat it today but it's kind of like this, like, you know how there's like something that points you in a direction? There's none of that. You're just aimlessly wandering. And you can go this way or you can go that way and fight another boss. You can go that. It's, it's For some people, people are going to like that, for sure. For me, I feel like there should be something, some slight goal hidden in a way of just randomly roaming around. You know, like even in Dark Souls, you feel like there is some sort of direction, right? So it's it's not enough for you to be a cute girl. No, no, <laughs> no. If that's it's funny that I'm actually OK with it, to be honest, because <laughs> like it because it, usually when you play kids in games, they, it doesn't it doesn't feel good, but it does no. feel like it, it, it feels OK. It's not bad. It, the controls are are totally okay. Um, the bosses sometimes if you fight a boss too early because you can't just fight a bunch of random stuff like the big bosses, not the the mini bosses are pretty easy, but the the big bosses they kind of you hit a wall. At least I hit one wall out of all the all the bosses, but one huge wall. But uh, yeah, I, I think it's I don't think it, I don't think it's gonna be like the hardest stuff. It's not some Dark Souls things. It's very forgiving. You die, you can just go back to your save point. You don't lose anything, your souls or nothing. Oh, like so that. it's it's not for hardcore gamers. No, gotcha. it's not a hardcore like which is which is good for 
for most people, I would say. We were just talking about that. <laughs> <laughs> most people don't want to worry about dying and not being able to do it. So if you like die at one, this particular boss was just like one of the, like the second one, you can just roam around endlessly at an, in another direction. Like, cause it's just like a big open map. Uh, I think most of the difficulty is monster uh, uh, thickness. Uh, uh, the density of monsters in a certain area. You have like some some birds, then you have some guys with arrows, and then all of a sudden you're in bullet hell <laughs> for some reason. Interesting. It's okay. It's good enough to play. It's good enough to beat. But it's it's okay. And I it, I guess this is the first time I'm saying like I don't think it deserves overwhelmingly positive. I, it feels weird to say that, but like it just it, I trying to figure out why people like it so much. But I guess it's just because of the material. It's just because it's JoJo with a, with a little anime girl. And that's enough for some people. Why do you think they called it Quietus of the Nights? Who, who uses that word? Who says Quietus these Japanese days? developers who find is, interesting words is that it? to describe feelings. Yes, probably. Uh... It looks a little Hollow Knighty. Yep, yep. That's the Japanese developer. I wish it was Hollow Knight. <laughs> Everyone wishes everything was Hollow Knight. Ooh, Announcing Hollow Knight. EA's brand new game, FIFA, the Hollow Knight edition. <laughs> yo, yo, Team Cherry, when I I know you don't listen to this, but when you gonna release fucking Silk Silk? What's the Silk? Road? Silk song. I, Silk song. Silk Road. Ooh. Silk Road. The, the, the old running. MMO. <laughs> we're, doing, we're doing some drug running. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, I thought you were talking about the actual video game called Silk Road. Oh. Yeah, there is a video game called Silk Road. Is there another one other than the MMO? There's a few of those. There's a few roads. Uh, anyways. Man, 21st of June. So that was two days ago as we're recording. Already 1,000 very positive reviews on Steam. So it's selling gangbusters. Yeah. Um, and it's it's nearly thirty dollars as well. It's twenty five bucks. Yeah. Man, success. success. Success for those guys. Yeah. <laughs> Man, I can hear the indie tone in your voice. I know. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. <laughs> success. Yeah. Goes back to that fucking the congratulations. Coin I was about. Man, it's so hard <laughs> to get noticed that yeah. You flip that coin just to get a thousand Steam reviews for sure. No, we we gonna Oof. get you notice, Liam. We're gonna be shelling on this podcast. I'm just gonna get Kojima to pretend that he makes games <laughs> for me. <laughs> the newest game from Kojima, golf. <laughs> <laughs> just golf. I'm surprised that 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 it has as much as it does. Five hundred. Recent reviews, 4,000 of all time. I'm comparing to Intruder, which we've been playing on the Discord, and uh, that's double it. There's twice as many people who have left reviews for Ender Lilies than Intruder, and I remember Intruders, a game that's been floating around for years. I believe it had a big crowdfunding campaign a few years ago, and it's been in a uh, early access state of development ever since, and I want to say going on at least three, four years now off the top of my head, maybe even longer. I tried to get into it, played a few sessions with the, with the Discord, about uh, four hours over two long sessions, and I, I, I don't know if I'm feeling it. I, I love me some multiplayer stealth games, but in this game, the map is too bright, the characters are, are too obvious for you to really get away with a uh, stealthy play style. What, what you do is ambush people because you make very little noise when moving, and it's uh, it creates an uncomfortable tension between between whether or not you really, really want to be trying to play stealthy at all or just run and gun. It's, uh, it's, it's, it seemed a little, a little more possible to to run and gun than I would have liked and that whenever a gunfight does happen it's all determined by the millisecond of who shoots first and 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 I I don't want to keep going on about it. I I tried getting into Intruder. A lot of people have recommended Intruder. A lot of people thought I'd like Intruder. I thought I'd like Intruder. I don't know if I can do Intruder though. Sounds like it's intruding on your thoughts. So you didn't have a good time. <laughs> 
I tried. I tried to have a good time, but it did not. It did not happen. I uh, I reinstalled Battlefield Four instead. <laughs> That's quite no the jump. Way. Well, the they they had the super duper hype E three trailer for Battlefield twenty forty two, and uh. after um trying and failing to get into Intruder, I wanted to play a big battle game where you can sit back and relax and get easy kills. And uh, I am, of course, not the only one, as it turns out, because right now, there's like, in in my North America region alone, maybe 15 full 64-player servers that are so full, you have to wait in line to get in any of them. And then when you do, they have some rules in place that will, like, instantly kill you if you drive a vehicle too early in the match or instantly kill you if you use one of the mortars too early in the match. There's a whole bunch of really weird server rules going on that are like, it feels like I forgot how to play video games all of a sudden when I log into this thing. It's hilarious how zombified this game is. It's in a state where where there's weird server rules that will randomly kill you for acting out. But also I feel terrified that a game from 2000. 14, I believe. Battlefield uh, uh, 4. I, I almost forgot which number it was. 2013. It is a while. Yeah, it is a fat while ago. It, it, it now looks and feels dated, and that makes me terrified, you guys. It's seven years ago. That, that a game from 2013 is... is uh, well, oh, no, it's eight, God. Years ago. it's eight years ago. Fuck. Shit. Is a while Why? Why? <sighs> in in uh in 1440p, it definitely does not look as good as I remembered that game looking back <laughs> in the day in 1080p. And it is weird because I swear I've like I've played Dark Souls on this monitor and had a cleaner, sexier image than what Battlefield 4 was giving me. It's like a flagship tep demo game for this whole generation. I was surprised at how how messy the LOD looks, how the grass is is this ugly uneven sprite on the ground and i mean it doesn't look bad at all but it definitely just kind of made me feel like i had to accept my own mortality when i noticed a game from 2013 start to look dated can i preach the uh the new discord um charter everyone loves this game so much they do, uh, for good reason. Uh, I want to tell you about Soul Nice Guys Guilty Gear Adventures. Soul Nice Guys, <laughs> dude. No one is is happy about Dolphin Girl. Uh, everyone thinks thinks I know is the coolest. Uh, you've been trying to read. I like it. Yeah, everyone everyone loves this game so much right now. Yeah, we it's taken over somehow. I don't know how, but it's taken over in in the Dead and Sons Discord. We have a true fight. The the literally the FGC is being rebuilt uh, from the ground up. Evo will be hosted in the Dead and Sons Discord this year, considering how much hype they got their rollback netcode. But the the lobby is still launched in a pretty the lobby's bad but the netcode is shape. is so good it's fantastic it's guilty gear strive it finally came out after being delayed. believe it or not Ooh. of all of all the games we could have been talking about guilty gear strive is uh is the one everyone loves dude it is it is fan i have paid i have played 40 hours of that game hell yeah uh it has been it, and it it looks fun it looks like you guys are having a blast oh, we're having i, I want to I, I want to hop in. I, I definitely want to like parsec it and try it and, and I might end up buying it. The netcode is so good that you don't need to parsec or anything. Like the netcode is so good. Like it's rollback netcode that actually works correctly in a brilliant way. The lobbies are terrible, but you don't really need to use the lobbies. Uh, I don't. I use quick match and go straight into training mode and then just match with people of the same rank. Um, and also... I've been playing with the Discord folks, you know, most of them are based in Europe, so they're in the park lobbies in Europe, and even though we might have 250 to 300 milliseconds of ping, the rollback netcode keeps it so it feels mostly like you're playing like a public, like a local game. It's insane. That is um, magic. It is absolutely magic, and, and it, you don't really... You don't realize what you're feeling, but it's so good. Aside from the fact that it's completely taken over the Discord, and shout out to everybody who's been playing it. You know, it's all been brilliant seeing everybody play every day. The soul is flowing, even from myself. It's brilliant. <laughs> um, but soul nice guy is here to stay. 
which is actually my online username for Guilty Gear Strike. Because <laughs> <laughs> I am playing Soul, uh, but I'm having a blast. This game is fantastic. Like, Really? It is, is fantastic. Is there anything like, other than multiplayer to play? Uh, no. Uh, which I do want to talk about because I think it's absolutely <laughs> hilarious because um, I can't remember. And it did lead me to watching four hours of Wooly's videos of him when he did the Guilty Gear Law videos last year. And I watched all of them and it's like four hours. And the Guilty Gear Law is fucking mad. It's amazing. Can you summarize? Uh, yeah, I can summarize. Uh, I think, let me, let me, okay. So there were three scientists, right? Mm. Frederick, uh-huh. uh, uh, a guy who you eventually know is called like Asker or something, and then uh, uh, Aria. And they're three uh, basically college kids, but they're obviously the world's most renowned student uh, scientists in the world. And they're researching this thing about like combining magic and human beings together because all of a sudden technology is not allowed and it's called black ma- black tech and then we use magic instead of technology analog technology is thrown away and then somehow they successfully well aria dies for some reason of like an, a serious illness which makes the other two kind of you know upset but then somehow Asuka, who then becomes known as that man i'm ki- not kidding his name is called that man mm-hmm. he uh successfully sort of merges frederick who is a human and magic, making him the prototype gear. And this is why they don't have nipples, right? Uh, possibly, because um, he, he, Frederick, uh, as the story evolves on, you realize that he is Soul Bad Guy. Soul Bad Guy is what the a fucking gi- name. He I is the, he get over is the guilty gear <laughs> because he feels guilty about being a gear. And then the the <laughs> that man. He oh then makes God. he makes another gear, which is like the pure gear because it's all magic and no human, called Justice. And Justice is like the mother of all gears because she can like mind control all of the gears who are like these magical monsters now. And she sets about like creating the destruction of the world. And essentially, these three scientists fucked up everything for about two hundred years, and the world just gets shaped in gear image and then not gear image and then humans go to war with gears and then all sorts of shit happens and then a lot of religious things happen and then religion controls the world and then at the point where strive kicks off religion still controls the world so yeah guilty gear it's great um the game itself is honestly one of it, it's the most fun i've had with a fighting game since street fighter 4 I got like I don't include Smash Ultimate in that. You know, we've well, talked and joked Dragon about it. Ball Fighters didn't. didn't uh, no, do I know. I I think it's way better. I think I think personally it's way better. It's, and I think this is a contentious subject, but I think really if you've played fighting games for a long time, like, admittedly, I'm not the biggest fighting game fan in the world, but I was, and I was super into Street Fighter Four and Marvel, King of Fighters, and everything. And I, I you know, I had literally playing on a fight stick. Like I have my Soul Calibur. Three, uh, what is it? Soul Calibur Five PS3 fight stick here with me, and I've been playing. So you know, it feels like the old days of playing Marvel again, and I'm having a blast because it is compared to Exerd and compared to like Anx- a- uh, Accent Core and XX and everything. It's it is approachable. Um, the combos in this game mm. are not batshit crazy from the beginning. I keep hearing that that this is actually like a fairly beginner friendly experience yeah so one of the things they've done is like your health bar is like nothing like you're you're like you're like paper um so if you get comboed half your life will go in one combo dive kick yeah essentially like half your half your life will go in one combo and it you know and then we introduced like roman cancels which is one of their brand new things not brand new but one of their things that specifically makes strive pretty unique in its way because it's so easy to do something like that after you you know spend a bit of time learning um, you can annihilate people's health and that makes games really fast paced and it also makes comebacks quite easy um, and every character is super unique the roster is actually pretty small it's only 15 characters which means your options are quite limited so you really do sort of experiment with the cast the new characters like Nagaruyuki and like Giovanna are pretty cool the game is easily the most beautiful fighting game ever made it's absolutely gorgeous if if you have not even seen a screenshot of it go watch a video of it in youtube and just glorify over how beautiful it looks in terms of content though the game is pretty lacking you know it has an Mm. arcade mode that you just run through and matt it does have a story mode but guess what what it's a five hour cutscene that you watch and don't interact with 
Wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> what? You can, it's a five hour cutscene, like five hours of cutscenes. Can you pause it? Yeah, you can pause it and it has like chapters and you can save it. <laughs> and each chapter is like 20 minutes, like an anime. It's literally, it's literally a what? game that comes boxed with an anime. I'm not even kidding. That's kind of cool, but also like, I want to fight. What? So this is a weird thing. And I, I, you know, we were talking about this in the Discord and I, I'm of the thing that they missed a trick here, right? So you have a new fighting game. There is no other fighting games out right now that really can dominate your space, right? You are coming out into a market that, you know, is feverish for fighting games. It's been COVID. You've got great net code. People want to play a fighting game, like a, a high polished fighting game. And you have a more than you've ever had, especially for Arc Systems, like an accessible fighting game. Arguably Dragon Ball Fighters was very accessible too, but it did get pretty batshit crazy. And, and, the, and the net code was a block for this thing. Yeah, it was not COVID great. happened, you yeah. couldn't do your local tournaments anymore. So what you have is you have this story mode that has these cutscenes in it. It's essentially like an anime. And I think if you dive in, I've only watched the first chapter because honestly, I, four to five hours of this, I, I don't know. It sounds like the kind of thing that only like, three percent of players would have clicked on no like we have like four or five people in the discord who have watched all of it because they're mad but what you've missed is you've missed the ability to have people just cheaply engage like your arcade mode which is have these fights in you know when the people will watch and then people will engage in the fight but what you can do is you can introduce characters to you know, new players or even old players to try a character that maybe they would never try before, right? If you play, let's say you play Soul Bad Guy all the time, you never have touched like Zato One or uh, Potemkin, even though, you know, Potemkin's pretty easy. You know, if you've never touched those characters because they're kind of unique and they require intricate moves that are maybe different from doing like Shotokan stuff, like Quarter Circle Forward Fireball, yeah, you know, uh, Dragon Punch or Yuken and stuff like that. You have the ability to then set up these story modes where the player has to then play as Potemkin, right? Or they have to play as Eno, or they have to play as Faust, or something like that. But no, it doesn't do that. So you've got a game where players are going to pick a character and pretty much going to stick with it, right? Unless they absolutely, of their own will, will then change the character uh, and try it out. So I think they've missed a trick with the story mode. And in terms of content, it's pretty light. I think if anybody's read anything about this game, they know that the online lobbies are something people are complaining about. It's really kind of dumb. They use this weird like voxel pixel art style to set up the lobbies that looks so weird to the rest of the game as well. But actually then when you get into a multiplayer match with other people, the rollback netcode is so godlike at times that uh, you kind of forgive it a little bit. But as a pure fighting game with interesting characters, interesting moves, interesting system, I think it's I think it's great. I honestly do. So is there any single player content at all? You can do arcade mode. So, you know, like a typical fight one, fight two, fight three. There is at least an AI to practice with. Yes, right? yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? You can okay, yeah, you can God. you can always fight like the AI in arcade mode. It also does this really interesting thing where every fight has a randomized difficulty. So it's not like a linear curve where the easy, the first fight is always the easiest and the last fight is always the hardest. It has like a non-linear curve where it'll say like root extreme and then like you'll be finding like the extreme version of the AI for that character and it'll just come out of nowhere. And actually it's kind of interesting. It keeps that arcade mode pretty fresh because you're not expecting to just breeze through all of the first couple of fights to get to the end. But it is $60, so what, what is the bulk? What's the meat and potato that you're supposed to be spending most of your time with? Being a nerd in the training mode. and Training mode? And learning how to play the class. I'm going to throw it out there and say, I'm not somebody who likes, quote, labbing too much. Like, I don't like learning combos, right? Um, I would look them online and i practice them. But in Guilty Gear Strive, because it is stripped down to a point where each character has four to five things and you can kind of learn what links into what you then are more in like you're more enticed to try and lab and i've been doing like a lot of labbing that's where the 40 hours has come from right it's like at least 15 hours of that is me just like making my own combos or what I think is my own combos because I've not looked at anybody else's videos and then practice them and then landing them and then taking that mini goal of like, okay, I'm going to go into multiplayer now. I don't care whether I win. All I care about is if I land this one combo. And like with Soul, 
like he was one of the first characters I picked up alongside like Nagaryuki and like Ino is like I have that one combo and all I want to do is like he- like I just want to do kick heavy slash into like a bandit revolver into Roman cancel into like slash heavy slash bandit revolver and then I'm like replaying that in my head over and over again and if I land it perfectly with the Roman cancel in the middle I don't care whether I win or lose but I've achieved that mini goal and I'm really enjoying that because then it all it becomes about you just, you know, you let go of the salt and you don't really care. You you learn about each character. And I think one of the things that everybody in the Discord has been doing is trying to find out what punishes what. We're all like, oh, that character's bullshit because it's so, like, Ramlethal and Faust have these massive weapons that you can sort of, like, you can literally hit people from halfway across the screen. And then everyone's like, well, how do you punish that? What can we do to, like, get in and stuff? And everyone's sort of figuring out these little things together. It's really great. And I think it is amplified by the fact that everyone's playing at the same time. Therefore, there's always someone to play against. There's always somebody to read. There's always something to read. That's the thing about fighting games, right? When fighting games come out, there's, like, this huge, like, wave of, like, excitement. And, like, people don't let go for weeks and weeks. And they, it's very, it's kind of different to other games. Um, just because there's so much to find out that you can't just immediately read about, you know, not stop story like if everyone's playing the last of us 2 you know immediately within a day someone's going to post story spoilers and etc etc but with this it takes time for people to figure stuff out and you know all of us in the discord learning together and like playing together um they're organizing a tournament and and already like the hype of just how solid a fighting game it is it can be improved but really is like a really accessible fun and you know, once you start going online, the netcode's so brilliant that that barrier of being frustrated by lag, which is, you know, plagued fighting games for a long time, is kind of non-existent, almost. It's not perfect, but it's as close to perfect as we possibly can get. So then you're just looking at yourself like, okay, well, I didn't miss that combo because of the netcode. I missed that combo because I fucked that up. And I, that's a good feeling to have, I think. It's such a great game. Oh, yeah. Let me tell you, it's great. I love getting beaten at fighting games by Liam. <laughs> <laughs> Well, shout out to Elso. Elso, who is our like Titanfall champion, is also what happens to be our bloody Guilty Gear champion already. He's like in the highest level of heaven of the tower on the online, and he's already crushing all of us. Um, but everyone else seems to be on quite a fair level. Oh, um, man. Gil- Guilty Gear is the one that goes heaven or hell in the beginning of a match, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Let's rock. Yeah. I, I I can't unforget how crazy the UI of Guilty Gear Double X looks. Oh, God. It's so beautiful. I love everything that's cheesy about this game. Like um, when a new, you know, when somebody comes to, you know, fight you, it's like, here comes Daredevil. It's not like, here comes a Daredevil <laughs> or here comes a new daredevil it's like here comes daredevil and it's just like shameless. skipping words and it's great and it's shamelessly shameless. japanese english it's let's rock utterly shameless it's brilliant it's so brilliant <laughs> it's like reveling in old video games that's what it feels like it's a new fighting game that is a byproduct of like old japanese video games and it's great you like that you you really like old japanese video game jank camp you like old japanese game camp it's not jank i feel like it's yeah it's not jank it's It's, camp it's camp and it's an aesthetic it's like video games now we all sort of understand what the quality level of everything is even in indies you know you know matt's you know sort of described um the game he's playing right i I even forgot what the name is it elden we or whatever in the elder lilies elder lilies but you look at it and you're like okay yeah Sort of seen that kind of thing before. It's very polished, looks very beautiful, blah, blah, blah. There's something missing about Soul Bad Guy saving the vice president from a load of (laughs) troops in a story (laughs) mode that doesn't even have any interactivity. And then it's just a fighting game tacked onto an anime. It's fucking beautiful. It's terrible and great, but it does remind me of like the PS2 era of things and just takes you back to... it's, it's It's like those games that every YouTuber who makes videos about games, makes videos about. Like, hey, do you remember on PS2 released in 2004, a game by Arc Systems Works is this unknown fighting game you've never heard of, and it has the cheesiest dialogue in the world, but everybody has a memory of it. It's like that kind of time, that that era of video games, I feel like. 
I, I, I wonder if the Dragon Guard games would have really been remembered well enough to like develop this cult uh, community and also a little bit of mainstream success for Near Automata. But yeah, I wonder if the Near Cult fan base would have happened without YouTube retrospectives of Dragon Guard games. Honestly, I don't know. You're, it's when I think of it, I do think of like those YouTubers. I really do like. The people who talk about those games from that era where now we have moved past playing those games and they are now a thing we collectively talk about as past. Right. And and a generation of kids have grown up to who who now think that's old people games. Or even like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Or like just the feeling like, you know, like developers have like, I think quite honestly, Japan is still only one of the only places in the world that develops games where people were developing games at that time and are now still developing games. Like, you know, Daisuke Ishiwatari, the guy who, who makes, you know, Guilty Gear, he made the first Guilty Gear, right? In, in like the early 2000s, like even like, I think it was 99. I can't remember when the first Guilty Gear came out. But, you know, I mean, he's also Japanese, so the culture is a little different. So his philosophy of making games is not really going to change. So the feel and the aesthetic is going to be very similar just with all this new tech, right? Um, so that, that that's still that like era of cheese of video games comes through that you just don't get anymore. I think Nier is a good example of something very similar, right? Like Yoko Taro is an older guy and he's been around a long time and he's made janky games before that the tech has evolved, but the feel never changed. And um, I do appreciate it. It does. It, it's like a comfy blanket. But thankfully, Guilty Gear is like, it's a comfy blanket wrapped in what is a fucking great fighting game on top of that. I'm really excited to what, like, it's got me excited about Evo and like watching people play it and like watching Maximilian play it on Twitch like every day. It feels like I'm a part of a moment and um, <laughs> it's good. I highly recommend, if you have any interest in fighting games, I think right now Guilty Gear is where you want to go. It's highly accessible. There's a lot of people playing. It's one of the highest peaked steam fighting games ever yeah i think street fighter 5 it beats it but you know it smashed everything else i think it even smashed soul caliber uh, and tekken so it's 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 hot shit man. oh that net code was awful though yeah when i i have never felt more miserable getting beaten by liam in fighting games than back when we were doing soul caliber <laughs> George, if you want in, get in. We're all in on it. You, 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 you're watching it. You're feeling it, Matt. You too. Get yourself uh, in. I feel like I missed the boat here. No, we, like we, we're we're boat. riding that wave right now. Oh, if you, if you, I don't know about that. It's sixty dollars. I just want to try it out, and then before, and, and then I. But I do think I'm at the cusp of picking that up. We've got a tournament coming up. I think everyone's playing really hard. You've got, I'm like, I'm looking over at the Discord now and like, you know, people are talking about it still. It's pretty, just every day. It's crazy. And I, 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 I just really like the look of Guilty Gear character design. Oh, Paper Bag yeah. Man is, is one of my favorite character designs ever. It's not my favorite iteration of Faust this time, but I do think some of his moves this time are just dumb as fuck. It's so brilliant. Yeah, Fair Play to Ox Systems. I mean... There's been betas and stuff, and people gave feedback. They listened. They didn't adjust the lobbies as much, but they did a lot of stuff. But it's great. I think it's very hard to get. It's it's hard. We don't see fighting games anymore, right? We really yeah. don't. We got Tekken Seven came out years ago. Street Fighter Five came out years ago. Everything else, you know, maybe Soul Calibur, but even that, you think nobody's really played Soul Calibur. Well, we also had a uh, Dragon Ball like a year ago, didn't we? No, that was four years ago almost. Are you shitting me? Nope. Arc Systems, like, uh, it was their, not their last game. Dragon Ball Fighter Z was 2018. Oh my God. Wow. <laughs> Are you serious? I thought we. Uh, I. Yeah. I don't understand yeah. how, how that can be four years ago. Time is not on our side anymore. Like, it's just the truth. <laughs> uh, uh, that also makes me notice um, we got like 15 minutes left, don't we? We should do some questions. Yeah, sorry. Um, play Guilty Gear.
join the soul nice guy army. I, uh, I'm, I'm looking at the timestamps here. Liam started loving Guilty Gear Strive uh, over 25 minutes ago. Nice, nice. All right. <laughs> we're we're going to switch over to some listener questions before before we, we totally run out of time over how much we love Guilty Gear. If you have a question or a suggestion or a word of um, hateful criticism, send it to dadandsonspodcast at gmail.com. Alternatively, we also have our Patreon channel open for questions all the time in uh, the hashtag listener questions first one is from that patreon channel massimar asks is there a game that you hate the vanilla version of but you love the specific game mode or dlc or a mod or something like that oh cyberpunk absolutely they've completely <laughs> fixed the game um you know people don't spawn yeah? their car anymore yeah absolutely. really they modded it up it's nice and sexy now play through it twice well, now so so, what what mods do you need on to make it make it good? No, you, you can't mod a trash game, George. Oh, Matt, you got me. You got but, me. Sh- I want to believe. <laughs> I I I I don't want to be so negative and cynical as I am. I'd like to, but 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 then no. you j- and then and now I'm back down again. You you can't build a house on sand, George. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I I was gonna suggest a mod. Uh, what got me into modding when I was a teenager was a custom level for Jedi Knight Two called the Ladder that just spawned you in a tiny room with bad guys that spawned in in waves, and you just uh, used the lightsaber combat of that game to happily chop away for tens of minutes at a time, and and it was one little level that made excellent use of of that game's combat mechanics and kind of sort of made me realize that that's all that game really needed someone could have made an entire video game with just that one room of enemies spawning in and successively harder difficulty and uh and called it the ladder and released it for 10 bucks on steam and it was inspiring i i I got into like modding and map making from from just that one level back in the days i played a lot of modded halo and I modded Call of Duty. That was pretty good. But uh, I would say for an answer, Destiny. Destiny 1, not 2. I don't know what the fuck they're doing with 2. I had just, I just got up like, oh, let me play a little co-op with Destiny 2. And they removed the whole story. And you have to now go to some section to, to, to get the story up and running. They put you at the end game. You, you had to play it on launch. You missed out. That they they got you with the fear of missing out. No, well, well I did. I did play that launch. I rebeat the story, and it was just like, I don't know. It was like paper thin. Uh, but I still wanted to play the story again, and they like launch you in it's gone. with a new character straight at the end. And I'm like, wow, all these free to play people are coming in, thinking that they're gonna play something cool, and with Nathan Fillion and all that, and Lance Reddick, nothing. And they don't know where to go. Like it's not it's not said, hey, if you want to play an actual story, go here and you know, do this. But uh anyways, uh Destiny One was bare bones and then when all the del- DLC came out, I got all that and that was actually a fun time. A really, really fun time. Destiny one was uh was fun. It's definitely fun. Liam? I'm not really sure specifically. I usually, you know, I'll play games when they launch. So then I'll play the original version and then, I don't know, not play anymore. And then people will go off and be like, oh, this game got really good or something like that. I'm trying to think if there's like specific DLC that I really, really liked the first DLC for Red Dead Redemption when I bounced off the game initially. Zombies? The zombies one. Yeah. I really, really liked that DLC. And that then made me go back and play through the entire game. Um, Mm. So I feel like that was a good one. And then I I did enjoy that. I really enjoyed the game after I stuck with it. Um, The Zombies one was really good. Really, really good DLC. Um, You know, Quantic Dream games often have a really good first, like, room. Like, uh, cleaning up the body in Fahrenheit or Indigo Prophecy. Or... um, screwing around with your your family in the bathroom in in uh in heavy rain Hmm. i think speaking of like fighting games i think you know a lot of fighting games maybe some come out rough and then get better i think street fighter 5 is one of those that came out pretty rough and generally didn't wasn't liked by anybody 
uh, and then now has improved to a point after patches and new characters and stuff where it's got to a point where it's super interesting and stuff like that. I still don't really play it, but I do think it has improved over time. Um, but I, I can't really think of anything specifically that has stood out to me. I feel the first levels in Sonic games deserve a mention. Because <laughs> they're they're actually like smooth, clean roller coasters. There's some some happy, fun territory. They tend to to not make you slow down and do uh, platform jumping puzzles until two or three levels into a Sonic game. And if, uh, it's a game that has like vanilla content you hate, but just one or two levels you love. There, there's a lot of Sonic games on those lists. Yeah. Eric B says hi everyone in the early 2000s my friends and i played flash games created and hosted by a small independent company which is now defunct their website's long gone and after some googling there seems to be no proof that these flash games ever existed other than a few written accounts on various message boards simply put these games likely do not exist anymore in any shape or form is it reasonable for me to mourn the fact that humanity will never be able again to experience these crappy sliding blocks puzzles and badly programmed 2d platformers yeah that's weird there's a lot of stuff that's went missing I, I i think it is it is valid to 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 mourn the loss of uh yeah of of niche minor culture internet memories i mean there was a lot of flash games back in the day yeah we're like at this weird point maybe in the past 10 years where it's like not pre like pre-internet but like when internet got good for the first time, so 2001 to like 2008, when YouTube really started to take off, like that, those wild years of Newgrounds and Miniclip and, you know, all of those places that were the only places you could really go for entertainment, dig and whatever, um, they're changing, right? It's and, and a lot of those things are not being hosted because they're just put up on servers and then those servers go down and then they di they disappear. And, yeah. And, uh, you know, it happens with videos as well. A, a lot of Newgrounds content now will ask you to download a Flash Player executable and then uh, run the SWF through that and, and not all of them work. Yeah. You think like the death of Flash really affected a lot of this? It's uh, always relevant to point out that the model nowadays is on YouTube, but the reality is a lot of people could not pull an Ego Raptor and make that switch as easily as uh, the few examples we can remember now mm. did. There's um a lot of a lot of people who used to make Flash games who do did transition over to indie game development super flash with, brothers with full commercial products super flash brothers uh, you know team meat team meat yeah, got to start on new grounds too mm. actually it's funny you say this because i was doing some research the other day did you know that the second highest played game on browser so of course you can play a lot of games on browser and gets a lot of plays like a free game you can play in a browser one of the highest played games in the world right now is on new grounds what is it? Friday Night Funkin'. I saw a Kickstarter for a real, like, fully real funded ass version of game. that. Yeah, yeah. So it's yeah. based off a Ludum Dare game that released last year that they launched on itch.io and Newgrounds. So it's like a Game Jam game. It's had over 44 million plays on Newgrounds. It's absolutely worth pointing out, why don't we consider that part of the game industry the way that we do other amateur products on, on itch.io? Because this is the most played thing. It, it's got a Kickstarter for a funded version, and it apparently passed me by. Like, I did not hear about that until the Kickstarter, but if it's the most played browser game, I feel like that means there's a lack of coverage happening somehow. Well, Newgrounds is not exactly something people immediately go to, right? Like you would imagine, oh, 40 million plays on Newgrounds? 40 million people visited Newgrounds in 2021? That must be the case if if the numbers are like that. There's a lot of people going to Newgrounds who aren't talking about it, I guess. Yeah, it's so weird. It's like Roblox. Like Roblox is absolutely huge, ginormous, but no <laughs> yeah. one talks about Roblox. Everyone's yeah. like, oh, the kids are growing up on Fortnite. No, they're really growing up on Roblox. Yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty crazy. I don't know. Yeah, like 44 million plays. 44 million. 
Fucking hell. Jesus. Jesus Christ. <laughs> and, and you know, that might not be money, but that is really good exposure. It has lent to money because the Kickstarter got $2 million. Any, anyone who makes a free project that still gets played by 44 million people is going to have millions of eyeballs on their next project. Mm. It's social capital. Speaking of social capital, <laughs> beautiful timing. Mr. Bubble says, are you okay with public nudity? Have you ever been naked in public? Yes. Yes. Really? I went skinny dipping. Same time as Matt. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did it together. We held hands. And so it was beautiful. Um, yeah, we, uh, uh, no, not we. Um, I skinny dipped. <laughs> I skinny dipped in Coney Island. Uh, oh. Uh, in New York. New York City. Was it, to... was it cold? It was very cold. Was it, was it like <laughs> gross? Was it polluted? Did it's you come polluted. out with like a layer of slime? <laughs> I mean, I mean, I mean, I wasn't the only one getting naked, <laughs> but yeah, <laughs> it was. I was younger. It was the younger days, but yeah, I've been I've been naked in public because that's pretty much a public beach. <laughs> I don't. Th I I think I've been naked one more something at some other place, but I can't remember. Oh, it wasn't wasn't the room, was it? With the roommate, the apartment um, hunting? No, no, it the was free not trial, with the roommate. Try before you buy. <laughs> oh, gross. <laughs> I, don't, ugh, I had to take a bath after going inside of his apartment. So, Ooh. Yeah. Uh, Hope there weren't any cameras installed. No, I'm pretty sure they were. I don't know whether I want to disclose <laughs> the information. Like, it, it's one of those weird things where you can't, you definitely cannot do it now, right? Like, it was like that pre, not, not pre internet, but like, that jackass MTV2 era where people were then with friends, you know, especially if you were like in skating groups or metal groups or whatever, you would like do jackass and Dirty Sanchez-esque stunts with friends like in school mm. and stuff like that. And there were definitely multiple times where it was like, oh, I dare you to, you know, I think I jumped off a sand dune in front of tourists naked once in Wales um we had like just this, for shits and just giggles. for shits and giggles just for shits and giggles but the best one i remember and i i didn't do this but i facilitated and watched this happen whereas in my university house so i lived with my four friends we had this big townhouse in university and of course that would you know it'd be like a sort of collective ground for people to meet quite frequently we'd play smash america drink whatever right smoke the old bud and we would get drunk and then, you know, do these jackass kind of things. We all had like skating backgrounds and we all grew up on like MTV2 and stuff like that. And there was one time where we were like, okay, it was the middle of the night. It was like 3 a.m. I went to Aberystwyth University, if anybody wanted to know. It's a seaside town, beautiful place, but it's quite small. So you could do like a lap of the town within, I don't know, 20 minutes or something if you ran. So I think we played a game and we all, we drew straws or something about people carrying out this this stunt so let's say this stunt the idea was that you'd have to run out it was 3 a.m you'd have to run around you'd have to do a lap of like the streets so you'd have to run to like the convenience store back through a certain part of town where people who'd been drinking would be stumbling home and then you'd have to run back to the house and you had to do it naked without a compass Without a compass, they not oh, as uh, oh. that. That still blows my mind that you did that. Never leave house if you're naked without at least a compass. Without a compass, so three of them, <laughs> including my brother, who I'm now adding as somebody who did this, stripped down <laughs> completely naked. Right, and the idea was that they would run around, and you know, it'd be hilarious, and we'd film them. But what we did is they ran around, and we locked the front door. So as oh, soon as they came back, bastards! <laughs> as soon as they came back, they like they're like they're super giddy because you know they just did it and everything and they're all hype. But then they realize and they come to open the door and it's locked and they're like they're like really trying to force the door open because the commotion of them like being giddy and like running around is like and rattling on this door is like 
drawing other people to look out their windows and then like the the street across the yeah, road. And yeah, and I mean if the cops get who knows what could have happened, they'll they'll bring their guns. Bit different. In a Welsh no, in a in a Welsh village you probably get away with an ASBO or something, which is like an antisocial behavior warning or something. Nothing else would happen. But all these people in the houses across, like, there are other students as well, right? This is a university town. They start, like, filming my brother and my friends just, like, nakedly banging on this door. And then we finally let them in, and it is so funny. But, like, a couple of days later, we started seeing pictures floating around on Facebook around <laughs> university groups of, like, Oh, from that's Thursday why you night. can't do like, it anymore. <laughs> it was yeah, so... Yeah, it was oh, already, God. already in that era. Oh, oh yeah, this was 2009? maybe i think so you yeah. know even then it's like on the cusp but oh god so funny and there's always like one fucker right there's like one dude who loves getting his dick out or loves getting naked <laughs> yeah, yeah. and he, he will use any excuse to just really? be like oh i'm naked again <laughs> it's like yo <laughs> Pete, Man. like Peter, calm down. <laughs> like, you, like, chill out, bro. <laughs> like, no, this is not the time for it. This is this is what it's like having cooler friends than me. <laughs> well, you can't get it. Those friends would be in prison wow. if we kept doing that these days. So yeah, I feel like that time is past. It was a glorious time, but maybe not again. I've I've only been naked in a locker room just once, like in a gym locker room. Yes. You haven't seen the joys of like old Japanese men like hair drying their balls. I fought all of all of the the, the just shame inside of me, all of the the natural urge to put pants back on when I was in the Japanese onsen for the one time in my life to get over that uh, irrational taboo phobia and get naked in a locker room just once, and that's the closest I've ever come. And, and and that's when the uh, uh, a local came up to you like, oh, super bunny hop. Super bunny hop. <laughs> right? No, that was a couple days earlier. And then he looked down. <laughs> oh, wow. oh, thankfully oh, that didn't oh. happen there. But that that did happen on the streets of Akihabara. <laughs> yeah. So you're actually not too far off. Oh God. All it takes is one time. <laughs> and someone has a picture of George's ass all over the internet. <laughs> I'm, I'm wondering if anyone anyone has ever had that happen to them in the locker room now. If anyone has introduced themselves to their favorite shit tier e celebs <laughs> that they might have uh, overseen getting naked in the locker room somewhere. At least then you don't have the fear, George, that maybe there is a picture that you don't know about from years and years and years ago mm-hmm. of your of your junk on that could potentially have reached the internet. Yeah. Yeah. When, when Liam gets famous, we're all, someone's going to say, Oh, look, oh I, I have a picture of him. Oh, look at his ass. Thank, thank God. Like Dan sons is contained. <laughs> <laughs> it's just an okay podcast. I will not comment on, uh, uh, yeah, I have no official statement to make at this time. That's, that's what you say. <laughs> right. Right. Matt, I'll stand by you when your uh, your your sea monster gets posted on the internet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. No, I'm telling you outside. guys, <laughs> we're like a little peanut. <laughs> you 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 have to say that you have no comment to make it this time. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Or- no comment at this time, <clears throat> yeah, whether no, no or comment. not Matt's sea yeah. monster was a sea monster. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. The the more the more people guess, the 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 less ammo you'll give them to uh, confirm their hit. <laughs> the Coney Island Nessie, they call it. That could have been <laughs> been anyone at Coney Island that year, right? Look look up the records. Oh man, that was years ago, man. I had I had hair back then. Like, there's no way it will even be recognizable. I can't believe so many people are gonna be drawn to this podcast for the first time because of jason schreier and they're gonna listen <laughs> so 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 this, <laughs> to this yeah this this was from a period in matt's life where all the hair was on top and not on bottom yes <laughs> <laughs> yes Da-ding! and with that we uh that's that's probably a sign that we should be checking out of uh, here i am pol- apologies to all Jason Schreier fans who've joined us for the first time. And our regular fans who've joined us for the 171st time. Oh, damn. How have we made it this far? 
I apologize that we have made it this far. Um, <laughs> that that we uh, want to thank you for listening this hard. Um, retroactively, thank Jason Schreier for showing up. Yep. Thank you to uh, uh, you know you two, uh, uh, Liam Edwards and Matt Visual for for being such lovely co-hosts. Thank you, boys. Oh, Been a pleasure. You. And uh, thanks to Henry Ng for the background, Ryan Lafford for the theme song. <laughs> <laughs> we're just going down the list, huh? Yeah, going going down down the list. Thank you, Discord, for hosting our Evo Guilty Gear tournament. Uh, uh, CuriosityStream.com slash Super Bunny Hop for uh, 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 a one-year subscription at $14. Thank you, Office gift Depot, for, for my chair. Yeah, right, Dude, yeah. Thank you, literally... my doctor, for fixing my leg. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> I, yeah. I actually get, like, automated browser advertisements that say curiosity stream the perfect gift for dad <laughs> <laughs> wait can we copyright that can we can we tell them that that's what we want <laughs> our advertisements to be it's, it's too perfect not to be 